In our last lesson, we learned that your baptism procured for you the benefits of Christ's death. You were baptized into his death, according to Romans 6 and verse 3. And I want to hasten to say that this really did happen. These are not just words. The death of Christ has been identified with your reconciliation to God, the separation of you from the land of enmity, where you were God's enemy. Now you are God's friend, more than a friend, you are his son in Christ Jesus. The death of Christ procured justification for you and made you righteous, destroyed the devil and brought peace to you. And you have been baptized into Christ's death. I continue to be amazed at the things that have been accomplished in baptism. Such a large area of benefit. It ought not to surprise us that Satan has extended himself to distort this doctrine with such things as infant baptism, sprinkling and pouring instead of immersion, believing that baptism is not necessary, but that it's only preferable, and that it does not have anything at all to do with salvation. These are satanic emphases, and they are designed to rob God's people of the benefits of their baptism. Let us be alert to them and desire within our hearts to obey the truth and to love the truth and to keep the truth. In the words of Solomon, to buy the truth and to sell it not. The effects of our baptism not only are wrought in heaven, but they are wrought among our enemies as well. One of the most wonderful realities of all time is the spoiling or casting down of our enemies, the principalities and powers that are aligned against us. We want to probe into this in this lesson and to demonstrate to you graphically and to proclaim powerfully by the Word of God that in your baptism, satanic powers have been depleted, that they have been neutralized, that they have been robbed or spoiled and plundered by your association with the death of Christ. Our text is found again in Colossians, the second chapter, and verse 12, which teaches us that we are identifying with baptism at this point. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him. On down into the 15th verse, which is a continuation of the thought began in verse 12. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is, in the cross. In the cross with which you have become identified in your baptism. Principalities and powers spoiled. I want to take a few moments here and develop the thought of our enemies, who they really are, and those against whom we wrestle. I trust that you do not consider men, women, boys or girls to be your foes. Your basic foes are not flesh and blood. Now the Word of God teaches us this quite candidly in the sixth chapter of Ephesians and the twelfth verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word wrestle indicates severe competition and opposition. We are not aligned against flesh and blood, men and women, personalities kin to ourselves. We are foes that we are wrestling against, our principalities and powers, high forces, devilish forces that occupy regions of the air, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 2. Looking into these opponents, let's take a moment and identify them more particularly. Principalities are authoritative forces in the world of evil. They are unseen to the eye and have Satan as their prince and as their leader. They are principalities. That is to say, they have evil authority and execute dominion in the realm that they rule. I hasten to say that Jesus Christ has been exalted above these principalities and powers. They are not invincible. They are under the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and 21 tells us that Jesus Christ has been exalted high, set in the heavenly places at God's right hand, far above all principality and power. So there is no principality against which you are aligned that is not under Christ and in submission and subjection to him. This is a good thing to know, that you've been baptized into the one who exercises all authority over all principality and power. Their evil domain 
is that of moral wickedness and depravity. These principalities govern the world of sin and have charge of disseminating sin, making it grow, making it alluring, making people serve it. Principalities. We also wrestle against powers, those that have influence and that are invincible in moral darkness. These allure into their realm, entice people by spiritual power, not by coercive or military power. They allure people deceptively to come into their area of domain, and when they get you there, they're invincible. They are powers. Jesus has been exalted over these also. In 1 Peter 3.22, it proclaims that he's been exalted above angels and authorities and powers that have been made subject unto him. Powers, those evil spirits that have influence among men, and their influence is absolutely invincible and impregnable in the area of moral darkness, where people are ignorant of God, these powers reign supreme. We also wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world. These that promote spiritual ignorance. Darkness in Scripture is a term denoting ignorance, not aware of, blind to God. This darkness does have a power about it. Colossians 1 and verse 13 says that Jesus Christ has delivered us from the power of darkness, and God through him has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. This power of darkness is a power of ignorance. If people can be alienated from God, ignorant of God, unaware of God, they will become the inevitable slaves of sin. The rulers of spiritual wickedness and spiritual darkness enslave men to sin by blinding them to the gospel. Now you must remember that ignorance, spiritual ignorance, a lack of knowledge of God, alienates from God. It makes you his enemy. In the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse 18, this intriguing statement is given. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. These spiritual forces then intend to blind men's minds, to shut their understanding off from the gospel. The God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 proclaims, has blinded the minds of them that believe not the gospel. They blind their minds by alluring them to false things, to darkness, to moral depravity, and to things that are not unacceptable before the living God. We also wrestle, however, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the governors of the empire of sin. These are extremely influential, as is indicated by one example in Acts the 8th chapter and verses 19 through 22. Here is an example of the effect of their influence upon souls that will yield to them. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. This man had responded by submitting to evil powers, spiritual wickedness, in high places. Their job to promote ignorance of God, blindness to the gospel, to distort the knowledge of God, to distort salvation, to make men ignorant and deprive them of the good and blessed knowledge of God. Now the Word of God tells us that you, as a believer, are wrestling against these powers. You are competing against them striving against them, battling with them, as they seek to influence you for the devil and to draw you away from the living God. Now their chief weapons are craft and subtlety. They have no coercive power. They can't make you do anything. They can only allure you. 
tempt you, deceive you, distort the truth, and cause you to believe a lie by attracting you to what's not so. Now their primary target is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their intent objective is to bring the church down, to make it powerless by turning it away from the truth and turning it away from Christ and causing it to ignore the spiritual resources that are its in Christ Jesus. You as a baptized believer are part of the church. You have been added to the church according to the second chapter of Acts. And now these powers are aligned against you. They promote false doctrines that are designed to hide the gospel and deprive men of the benefits of salvation. In 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and verse 1, the apostle says, The Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons. So you see here that we occupy an extremely volatile realm. Here the spirits of demonic forces are working to beguile and blind men. They invent doctrines. They try and seduce men away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to be alert, not ignorant of them. You wrestle against them. And may I pause just to say this that if you do not retaliate by resisting these forces, they will not let up their influence. They will not quit wrestling because you do. They are intent upon keeping you out of heaven, and you must be intent on getting into heaven and wrestle against them. One further word about these, this battalion of false and evil wicked spirits. They, they come sometimes disguised as apostles and messengers of God. They don't come like devils with horns. They are disguised, subtle in their approach. In 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 13 through 15, the apostle warns us of false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For, Christ, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. An unwise, uninformed person cannot possibly avoid being snared by these forces. You must not content yourself to be ignorant of the word of God ignorant of the things of God, ignorant of the blessings of God. You must not content yourself to rest in the wisdom of another. You must get in there for the Lord. Probe into the things of God. Capitalize upon the truth because you have a battalion of forces that are aligned against you and they will bring you down if you do not know the truth, which makes men free. Now the doctrine we want to bring quite clearly to you today is that these forces have been spoiled and robbed in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they have been brought down by the Prince of Life. Now this is the proclamation of our text in Colossians 2 and verse 15, and I want to go over this again with you. This is a liberating truth. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus Christ, in his death, in the cross, as is referred to here, actually triumphed over all these evil forces against whom you wrestle. In what appeared to be his hour of weakness, for the word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 4, that he was crucified through weakness. In what appeared to be an hour of weakness, he triumphed over the forces of evil and spoiled their kingdom. Spoil means plundered them, robbed them, took away from them their resources, frustrated their ambitions. Jesus did this in his death. This is the proclamation of Scripture. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them. He displayed them as inferior. He displayed them as inferior to you, believer, in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went down into the grave and he, but he came back from the dead. He arose victorious over the grave and in so doing plundered and spoiled principalities and powers. There his body in the grave 
and his spirit in Hades, or paradise, as it's called by Luke, there he retained himself for three days. For four millennia of time, 4,000 long years, no one had ever come back from the regions of the dead under their own power. The regions of the dead had maintained a tenacious hold upon every person that went into it. No person came back under his own power. Now here is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's received a commandment from his Father. His Father has said, Lay down your life a ransom for many, and then take it up again. Three days he's in the grave. Three days his spirit is in paradise. As it were, I picture the spirits against which we wrestle converging upon him to keep him there, to keep him in the regions of the dead. They must not permit the Son of God to rise again. But like mighty Samson of old, Jesus shook himself, and he arose triumphantly from the dead. And when he did, he broke the power of the enemy. A new day broke when Jesus rose from the dead brother and sister. A new day. Satan's power had been spoiled. His powers had been plundered. And the race of man potentially went free if they will just receive it. I cannot help but think here about a word that Solomon gave in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now it was a day, a word spoken with a lot less light than we have in Jesus Christ. A day spoken, a word spoken during the twilight age of Revelation. I'm reading this to show you that there was an element of hopelessness that uh, existed concerning the grave prior to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, verses three through five. There is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, but the memory of them is forgotten. Now that statement is true from man's perspective, from earth's perspective. If you take eternity out of the picture, if you take heaven out of the picture, God and Christ out of the picture, that appears true. All oh, but believer, they are not out of the picture. They are in the picture. And is there anyone, is there anyone in Christ Jesus that would care to believe that the dead know not anything at all? Or that there's no hope for them or no reward for them? Ah, there is. The power of the enemy has been spoiled and there is hope for the dead. Those that have died in Christ have not perished. They shall be raised from the dead and inherit all things along with those that live for Christ Jesus here in the earth. As the word of God says, he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus Christ coming back from the dead spoiled principalities and powers. Now we have made reference to this verse once before, but I want to bring it to your attention here. It's found in Hebrews, the second chapter in verse 14. It's a sort of verse that's almost difficult to believe, but the more you hear it, the more wonderful it sounds. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus Christ, also himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now you must reason upon that. Did Jesus die? Then Satan is destroyed. Or in the words of our text, principalities and powers have been spoiled, plundered, frustrated. Their efforts to cast men down have been voided if men will believe the gospel. You can recover yourself from the snare of the devil. The word of God teaches this. You can recover yourself from the snare of the devil by faith in Jesus Christ. Satan is so powerless, he is so inhibited by the truth, that those that have been baptized into Christ Jesus into his death have experienced the spoiling of principalities and powers. They've actually been able to refrain from doing things they've done for years that were wrong. 
They'd been unable to embrace the gospel, which Satan tried to blind them to. Their eye of faith pierced through and saw the truth, even though for years, for some of them, Satan kept it from them. How were they able to do this? Principalities and powers had been spoiled in the death of Jesus Christ. Now, if what I have said is true, and it most certainly is the truth, death belongs to you. Now, I may be speaking to someone here that is even on the very edge and brink of death. You know, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Death belongs to you, believer in Christ. You that have been baptized into Christ own death. Now this is a statement found in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Now by saying that, he doesn't mean that you can avoid death. It's not yours in that sense. You cannot hope to avoid it. When Jesus spoiled principalities and powers, what he meant is it can serve you, not be your enemy. Your death can be your friend. You know, the word of the Lord says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And it can be to you too. It can be the gaining of glory. That's what it means for Jesus to destroy Satan by death, for him to spoil principalities and powers in his cross. It means that death and the things that were against you can serve you now can serve you by you passing through it with the Lord Jesus Christ. Death, you know, lies in between you and heaven, between you and glory. It does so because Satan has been robbed of his power. You can rest assured that Satan's design in death is not to induct you into glory. His design in death is to separate you finally, once and for all, from God. But he's been spoiled and destroyed. Let your faith get a hold of that. You see now... We have an intercessor in heaven, not an accuser. The accuser of the brethren has been cast down, and an intercessor now is at the right hand of God for us. Let me remind you of this truth. The promise was given in Genesis, the third chapter, in verse 15, that the seed of woman, that's Jesus Christ, was going to come and bruise, mortally bruise, the head of the serpent. I announce to you that in the death of Christ, Jesus bruised the head of the serpent. The head of the serpent has been mortally bruised, and you can triumph over him. Now there are some glorious results that accrue from this, and we do want to go over a few of them. You see, it's my purpose for you to have confidence and assurance in your relationship to God that was initiated by your baptism and that is now maintained by your faith. You see, you have been raised up with Christ to sit with Him in heavenly places. That's the proclamation of Ephesians, the second chapter, and verse 6. He's raised us up together and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Now, you want, you want to remember that in Ephesians 1, 3, it tells us that He's also blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That's in the realms where Jesus is and where God is. That's where, negatively speaking, where Satan is not. You see, the truth of this is this, Satan is powerless in heavenly places. When a person resides by faith, when you are aware of the benefits of God and the glories of redemption, and you walk in the light of that, Satan is, Satan is powerless in this realm. It's a wonderful truth that you must get a hold of. Satan cannot enter here where Christ is. You have to be in His realm, the realm of darkness, for Him to work effectively in you. You see, Satan's power is deception, and deception is not applicable in the realm of truth. This is what Jesus meant when He said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. The truth illuminates you to Satan's lie and permits you to rescue yourself from the snare of the devil. 
Let me restate it a little different. You must know how repulsive a lie is to God. If a person persistently lies, they cannot dwell in the presence of God. God will abandon them. No lie is of the truth, and God cannot lie and abhors lying. Believer, the truth is just as obnoxious to Satan as the lie is obnoxious to God. When you dwell in the truth, it repels Satan like the lie repels God. So as you walk in this truth, you experience the effect of spoiled powers and principalities of the destruction of Satan. Satan, as it were, must flee. He can't tolerate the truth. Hold the truth over him of what you are in Christ Jesus. Now let me again tell you that this truth of the spoiling of principalities and powers, the destruction of Satan, has been associated with your baptism. Colossians 2.12 tells us we're buried with him by baptism into death. The thought continues down to verse 15 where it is announced that Jesus has spoiled principalities and powers by the cross. That is, he has spoiled them in the death into which you have been baptized. Now let's review briefly this wonderful message that we've just announced to you. Your chief enemies are not flesh and blood. They are principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness, moral darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. They are intent on keeping you out of heaven. And if they were not robbed and spoiled of their power, they'd surely keep you out. But as you wrestle against them, you wrestle in faith and in confidence, knowing that the gospel is true. Jesus Christ plundered these, these principalities and powers. He spoiled them. He robbed them of their resources and rendered them impotent in the face of the truth when he died. And you've been baptized into his death. The head of the serpent has been bruised. Occasionally, when I'm grappling with bad thoughts, I like to tell Satan, I see that bruise on your head. It's a mortal bruise. And my Savior put it there. And in the energy of that, triumph over the wicked one. Now I announce to you this glorious gospel. If you will resist the devil, he will flee from you. So resist him, steadfast in the faith, believing your baptism has put you into Christ's death where Satan has been destroyed. 